Uh, well, as you can see, this is Eveline, by the way. She's my uh, lovely assistant today. I know that you're in the end of the day, so I mean, your uh, a lot of your uh, sort of uh, energy has been spent. These are some Dutch treats. They're called stroopwafels. I hope you enjoy them. They have a slight sugar spike that you can sort of uh, drag your attention out for the rest of the of the day. All right, good. Let's start about talking about scribes. Scribes is what you need when you want to copy over the Torah. The Torah is the holy scripture of the Jewish people, and uh, scribes copy them by hand. They take an original uh, Torah and one of about 60 to 80 sheets of parchment that goes into a Torah that has been specifically tamed, scraped, cured, prepared according to very specific rules. And then they take a feather quill and they start copying the 304,805 characters in the Torah according to very specific calligraphic rules. And when they're done with one sheet of parchment, they give it over to another scribe. And the other scribe looks at the original Torah, looks at the parchment, looks at the new sheet of parchment, and starts counting all the letters, and all the words, and all the sentences, and the paragraphs. And then they take the center letter, and the center word, and the center sentence, and the center paragraph, and they compare all of that. And if there are more than three errors, that sheet of parchment that the scribe has worked on for weeks on end will not be accepted in a new Torah. What they do instead is they put it in a clay jar, because there are still holy words on this sheet of parchment, so you can't just throw it away. They put it in a, in a uh, clay jar. That clay jar goes into a cave, and that is where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like the, what we base the scripture on is basically erroneous documents. I mean, we go through some hardship when we go through, through code reviews, right? But this is a whole new level. Think about that fourth error that you made, about that tiny thing that you didn't write exactly right. You can't go back. You can't go like, oh, no, this actually meant this other thing. That's it. You have to just start over. I'm Frank Kornstra. And I work in this amazing team at Usabilla. What we create is voice of customer solutions. And what that means is we gather feedback through different channels like email, apps, and uh, the web. And we present that to our customers so that they know of their customers what they think of their online presence, their online products. All right, little show of hands. Who uses code reviews to merge in their uh, like new code into the main branch more than a quarter of the time? It's good. More than half of the time? More than three quarters? Almost all of the time? Ah, this is a good question. All of the time? Good. At Usabilla, we uh, do it for everything. Everything gets merged in only with code reviews. But what you notice then is that sometimes that process isn't going as smoothly as you want. And I think we all had that experience, haven't we? So I went to look for better ways of doing this, maybe looking at some patterns that we apply to code, looking at what's the mechanics behind all of this. So I'm going to run you through my findings. I'm going to first talk a little bit about the rewards and the efforts involved in code reviews, then about the async and non-blocking patterns that we can apply to this, and last, of, last but not least, how we can apply that consistently and consequently throughout our um, code flow, basically. But let's first start out with some rewards and efforts. I mean, this balance needs to be right, because otherwise, why would you do it? And we heard a lot about the reward side. First of all, it improves quality. Whatever you think of quality, be that um, the uh, less defects, be that more readability, be that better maintainability, all the abilities that you can think of, it would improve. And we also share knowledge this way, right? Be that inside the team, be that between teams, be that about technical stuff or about the domain. Patterns and anti-patterns that we want to see. This is how it works for our company. All that kind of stuff we share. 
it's, it's almost like this perfect picture. Better quality. Sharing knowledge. It's great. Why, don't, why doesn't everyone do it? We saw that not everyone does it. And that has to do with the fact that this perfect picture, like even look at this in front, right? These people with the camels, like they went through the desert for days probably without any water. Now they finally are here. But what I want to do with you with this specific talk is swivel the camera slightly to show you that there's also an other side to the coin and not to discourage you from doing commenting or doing co-reviews or all that kind of stuff, but to show you the whole picture so that you can make a conscious choice about what you want to do with your code reviews and how you want to do them. All right, first of all, everyone that did code reviews know they take time. And for me, it's more of a gut feeling, you know, that they do. But just how much, that's sometimes hard to say. Except when you go into the GitHub API and you just pull that data out. So that's what I did for a bunch of projects. I looked at how many hours does it cost on median to close a pull request for us, for our organization, just a few projects. What you need to keep in mind here is that correlation is not causation. If one thing goes up and the other goes up as well, it might be that one causes the other, the other causes the one, or that there's a third factor involved that, involves, that sort of causes both of them. And the second is, St this is not statistically significant. In no way is this statistically significant, right? It's just a few hundred PRs, just a few projects, but it gives you an image. And that image is as follows. If you take a look at how much time does it cost on median to close a pull request, looking at the, and then categorizing it by the amount of root comments. And a root comment to me is something that starts off the conversation. Every reply to that root comment doesn't count. Just something that starts off. Then you start seeing this picture. And sure, it's not like super clear trend or whatever, but it gives you a general trend, right? If you come into the 20 to 30 amount of root comments area, it might take you 400, maybe even up to 600 hours to close that pull request on median. And maybe we're really bad at this, but I can't imagine that for some of you, that picture doesn't look very different. Right? All right, if you then uh, divide that number by the amount of root comments that, that you have, you get the median time to close a root comment, basically, median time to fix a clo uh, root comment. And although the trend is a little less clear here, you still see that you can expect it to take about 10 minutes. And obviously, not statistically significant, bad code also gets more root comments and bad code takes longer to fix. But I think you sort of see a trend here. And that trend is comments take time. Sometimes we treat them as though they are free. Ah, oh, just a nitpick here. Ah, oh, this tiny thing here. Can you fix this? But that's not how it works sometimes. Comments take time. All right, but at least we get better quality, right? Yes, if you keep your PRs small. What you see here is a part of some, some uh, research that Atlassian did. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> and you see here, obviously, that if your comments are, are, or if your code reviews are small, like just a few files, yeah, you get a decent amount of time per file, but if you get into like 50 files, it takes only two minutes for a reviewer to go through, e through each file. That's hundreds of lines of code per minute for a code reviewer, right? All right, uh, by the way, this is where the Parkinson's law of triviality or bike shedding happens. We've all been in this uh, code review, I think. Or as Cardinal Richelieu said it, give me six lines of the most honest man and I will find something in it to hang him. People want to comment. That's perfectly fine. That is a sort of normal response, but it happens. All right, you know what we're going to do? We're just going to add more reviewers to this. That makes it better. Reviewers look, look at different files. Yes, but also reviewers spend less time per reviewer if you add more, and even worse. The total amount of defects found goes down. That is not defects per reviewer. That is total amount of defects found. What happens here is the bystander effect. 
the more bystanders you have with an accident, someone falls in the water, like whatever, the less chance someone has of actually getting help. Because everyone goes like, someone should really help this person. Right? This is what happens in our code reviews as well. Someone will take a look at this. Times one factor. Cognitive load is another. Um, just think about the fact that, uh, for example, we at Usabilla do uh, rebasing. Think about the fact that you have a small PR, only five files, because we know this. We need to keep it small. Uh, the first uh, uh, commit is the interface, and the subsequent four commits are all the implementations. How much cognitive load do you have when someone doesn't like the naming of a method in that first interface? Right? You need to change it. You need to think about the consequent changes that you need in all of those uh, subsequent commits, all the tests. Don't introduce new code style issues. Don't introduce any new bugs. All these things, right? We need to keep an eye on all of them. All right, time, cognitive load, hits on morale even if we're unlucky and people haven't worded things really nicely, are all things that create opportunity costs. Opportunity cost is cost incurred because you can only spend a scarce resource once. Cognitive load, time, morale, all these things you can only spend once. And that seems like a pretty grim picture. Like, why are we even doing this? It takes a lot of time and frustration maybe and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> it's pretty bad. Should we, should we even continue with this? Um, I think so. I think we can find some patterns that we apply to code and then maybe apply them to code reviews as well, namely async and non-blocking. Let's start off with the async patterns. Async to me, oh, there's more laughs than I expected. Uh, <laughs> async to me is getting stuff out of that code review context, launching it somewhere else in a different context, closing that code review, closing that pull request, and when the answer comes back in that different context, you might want to get back to this code. But maybe you don't even have to, right? What kind of issues are we talking about? Well, we're a pretty precise bunch. We look at a lot of things in code reviews, and that's good. But how can you look at this in a more structured manner? Well, I would uh, suggest to you look at this from a reward versus conflict perspective. Gives you a nice way of arguing about things. Because what you want is you want the humans to, to look at this side, high reward stuff. Because the low reward stuff just doesn't yield. Right? And the nice thing is that low uh, reward stuff is easily tooled away, usually. Things like linters, I think you use things like Clippy, right? Uh, the, the tools that the previous presenter, uh, the previous uh, presenter actually had uh, uh, gave you a view into. These are things that make it really easy to pull stuff out of that code review and uh, launch it on a build server. Don't even think about uh, having humans look at this. Just have tools look at this. And the nice thing about low conflictual stuff is it's pretty factual. Like, there's not a lot of people that are going to discuss with you like, is that really a bug? Come on, it's a bug, right? Um, low quality tests, a little bit harder sometimes. I know that your compiler does a lot of, your, of the work for you. Good for you. I come from a PHP world. You can start laughing now. Uh, and we have a lot of tools that do this stuff for us. But low quality tests, and maybe you have it as well. It's called mutation tests. So what it does, it applies mutations to your original code, sees if your um, uh, test suite actually picks these up, picks these changes up, if it covers these things. Functionality fails, sometimes has a little bit of discussion as well. No, it's actually a bug. No, it's a feature, whatever. Um, let's take a look at Gherkin scenarios, right? Let your uh, PO define these things in Gherkin scenarios and make, uh, make your tools actually prove that you implemented the feature correctly. All right, so low rewarding stuff is gone, low conflictual stuff is gone. What we're left with is highly rewarding, highly conflictual, and also highly subjective. Let's take a look at some other patterns that we can apply there. First of all, offloading is really easy. Code reviews 
per definition, are a bit of a low bandwidth environment. You could have to do everything in text, you have to wait for replies, all that kind of stuff. How about offloading it into a higher bandwidth environment? Things like setting standards. Ooh, do we need to spec it in this or do we need to spec it in that? How about you do that in a chapter meeting, in a development meeting, whatever your sort of meetings are for developers? It's really easy to offload something into there and go, all right, we'll just discuss it over there, maybe come back if we change our minds, but let's first go on. Sharing knowledge is also easy to offload. If you have a new team member and they're asking a bunch of questions on this code review, well, yes, obviously they don't know. So how about you take them uh, on the side and just run through the code review with them, like one-on-one. -on -one. It's really high bandwidth and it's way easier to explain all these things. Introducing a new component in your architecture. Another example. How about you give a presentation and just introduce, look, this is what the component is going to do, uh, this is our goals, and this is the amount of quality we're looking for in this specific component. All right. The tools we talked about before are easily run on a build server, because yay, it's the same for everyone. But if you can run them locally, that's even better, because you can actually run the tools outside of the code review. You don't even have to look at it uh, in the code review if they're actually running the build server. Local over remote helps with that a lot. At Usabilla, we use uh, make files in combination with Docker, the Docker files, to make sure that A, everyone runs the te test exactly the same manner with the same configuration, the same settings, all of it. And second, they run it in exact, exactly the same environment as the build server. And that is so powerful that new uh, developers now come in with us. They only have to do a git clone, done, then run make test, and they know exactly that everything works as expected. And whatever they break, they will actually see it locally on their computer exactly the same as everyone else will see it. Added benefit of this is that you can run it offline, but that's just yeah, mere sort of happy. But it's okay. Pairing is another good way of getting a code review outside of your code review. You, you, me, everyone here has idiosyncrasies in their code style. And that's perfectly fine. But we run into them during the code review, and that takes time. Pairing is a good way of getting a code review without having a code review. A continuous code review because that discussion is going on all the time. It's also a good way of sharing knowledge. And finally, communicating up front helps you to prevent surprises during the code review. Um, what happens a lot is like, at code reviews go like, yeah, but we already have like this other library for this, or this, um, this design pattern doesn't really look good. So how about making a UML? And just putting it in front of another developer, go like, you think this design pattern actually works here? Because changing that UML takes you five minutes. Changing the implementation in the, in the code review, wow, that is a lot more work, right? Again, setting standards, chapter meetings, development meetings, whatever you have, discuss things there. Like, what kind of libraries do we use for serialization? What kind of storages do we use? So that infrastructure doesn't come to your code review, goes like, yeah, we have different key value source. Um, you can't use Redis here, right? Communicating up front so prevents surprises. And these are just a few of the async patterns that you can apply. I think you can think of a bunch more, but you catch my drift. Get stuff out of code review, place it somewhere else, maybe see if you need the answer later on. All right, let's go on with non-blocking. What I think of non-blocking is I want to have the least amount of chance of having blocking comments. And blocking comments to me are uh, comments that tell you, look, I can't, uh, I can't let this go. I, I, I can't approve your code review without you actually changing this. Not having blocking comments, utopia. But we can at least diminish the chances of it. When you do run into a blocking comment, by the way, this is a good tool that Jeff Bezos introduced at Amazon. Disagreeing and committing. Because at some point, he says, you come somewhere where neither you nor the other person can prove it, right? 
this needs to be more flexible. Oh, this needs to be more flexible. Seriously, it's just like future telling. Nobody knows exactly the right answer, but at some point someone has to disagree and commit. And the committing part is really important. Because you can't go back and say, haha, I told you so, so you were wrong. No, you're disagreeing with me, but I'm telling you, or the other person tells you, is like, I trust you as a developer. I trust you as a professional. I think we just have different values, but I trust that you also thought really well about this, and, we're, and I'm committing to your decision. Before we saw that uh, finding the right, or um, adding more reviewers to your code review is actually making it worse for you. So finding the right reviewers is key. How do you do that? Well, first of all, inviting specialists. If you open your pull request, and you can already, uh, you already thought about some SQL queries, right? Where you thought, I don't actually know if this is the right way to do it. How about going to that line, doing, hey, at database specialist, can you please take a look at this? What this communicates to other people is that someone who is better at this is looking at this, so they don't have to play the same guessing game as you did. But also, the, the database specialist can go through these reviews quite efficiently. Another good tool is git guilt. Uh, git guilt tells you who added or subtracted the most lines between two commits. So in this case, I would add Renato, Rodrigo, and uh, Ani to this uh, review because they know obviously the most about this code. We um, communicate some of our stuff with uh, git mojis, right, in our commits tells you, oh, I patched this library, fixed a bug, I added a new feature. Right? We do this for commits, but how about we do this for comments as well? Let's reserve that first character for communicating intent. Tell your uh, author, look, I'm blocking this because this is really important to me, or I don't really like it, but if you have to, just go ahead, it's fine. I think this is not blocking to me. And the other is, we can solve this asynchronously. We can, I have some uh, questions here, but go ahead, just close the PR, I can come back to you one-on-one. -on -one. You maybe need to do a presentation, but we'll solve this asynchronously. So how about we, um, I mean, this is just a few tricks, async, non-blocking, all that stuff. But what I want you to do is not walk out of this room and in three weeks go like, this Frank dude had something, but I, what was it again? Right? What I want you to do is I want you to apply this consistently. I want you to create a code review etiquette. And an etiquette is nothing more than um, behaving yourself just a little bit better uh, than you're supposed to in a specific context. But it is highly contextual. So let's take a look at some context here. Some people really like it when other teams tweeze apart their, co their pull request. Me personally, not so much. For me, uh, if I look at other teams' PRs, I tend to take a step back, look at architectural issues, look at issues like, are we using the right patterns and don't we have some anti-patterns in here? Right? Look at broader architectural issues. Blast radius is another one. If you work on a monolith, Sure, like what you touch is what she touches, and um, we're all sort of working in each other's code base here, so it's pretty good to have deeper understanding. But if you're working on, let's say, a microphone that has been built in four weeks, hijacking that PR for a week is not legit in my book. And last of all, and last, robustness. If you're working on a payment system, by all means, go all out. You need to nail this thing down to the last centimeter. But on the other hand, if you're working on some developer statistics tool that spits out some numbers every three weeks, and if that doesn't happen and you like, sort of fix it in a week, it's fine as well. Those PRs and those code reviews need to look very different to me. All right, these are just three uh, sort of contexts that you can think of. Think of a bunch more. Pick then, let's say three, <coughs> and start doing code review reviews. 
look at these contexts, look at the code reviews that you've done, and look at some stuff that is, let's say, highly conflictual, very low conflictual. This is a PR that had a lot of comments. Not a lot of comments. Um, that was solved pretty quickly, closed pretty quickly. That was closed, that took a very long time. Right? And now you start looking at these code reviews in these contexts that you just defined and seeing how you can apply these async and non-blocking patterns to the code review. What you're dabbling around here is the complex uh, quadrant of the Kinefin framework. Kinefin framework is a sense-making device. It makes sense of your behavior, my behavior, in a specific problem domain. And what you're dabbling around with by creating this review etiquette is uh, complex. You have retrospective causality. You look at a highly conflictual uh, code review and go like, hey, now I get it. Like, Sandra didn't have her morning coffee, then Mike said this, then John did this, and like, bam, everything exploded all of a sudden. Retrospective causality tells you, oh yeah, this is how it happened. But you, it's very hard to see in the context itself at the moment what, what's the right thing. The only thing you can do is probe, sense, and respond. You probe by looking through these code reviews in specific contexts. And then you sense by discussing with a bunch of you. Go sit in a room and discuss how these code reviews should have been handled. What kind of async, what kind of non-blocking patterns could we have applied? How could we have done this better? And you respond by walking out of that room with a bunch of you and having a new understanding of this is how it works for our team, for our department, for our company to do code reviews. What I want to give, give uh, home to you is don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Right? Don't stop doing comments. Don't stop doing code reviews. But start being mindful about the opportunity cost that you create in terms of time, in terms of effort, in terms of hit some morale. And start looking at these async and non-blocking patterns. Think of a few more. Look at your code reviews in these contexts that you just discovered and think of a bunch more. And then start doing code review reviews. Start creating a code review etiquette so that you can achieve truly async and non-blocking code reviews. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Frank. Uh, yeah, where, where might be one quick question? Yeah, I was pretty tight on the schedule there. <laughs> yes, so let's just make it quick. Hello, thanks for the talk, nice talk. Uh, do you know uh, uh, the strategy called optimistic merging by Peter Hindrens, uh, the famous Sorry, the, the strategy for? Opt optimistic merging, it's uh, mm, a strategy for merging PRs without any code reviews, kind of without any co code reviews, and then like doing uh, some kind of review on the master branch after the fact. And yeah. like it was, it is, was quite successful at the several like open source libraries. And like maybe you've heard of it. Do you have any opinion? Yes. If, if, you, if you haven't heard, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. for listening. <laughs> no, thanks. No, uh, well, what I'm familiar with is uh, uh, it's sort of the same, I think, but it still happens before you merge into the master, is uh, communal uh, sort of code reviews so that you have like lunches, for example, with the developer team and you just go through like a code review, like just go through the code and see like how do, do people do sit different code reviews. First, that is terrifying because like the first developer that gets sort of uh, roasted almost during lunch. That is terrifying. But if you keep doing this week after week and like people feel safe in their environment, I think that's a really good way of doing it. But this is a, yeah, I think this is slightly different in the sense that you look back uh, after it's merged, right? That is the, yeah, exactly. I wasn't familiar with that, but um, I hope this sort of answers the question a little bit. All right, thanks. <laughs>